I just, I was recurring thought that I kept going around my head was, how is this possible? How can everything look so different? You know, because it's just to somebody who hasn't gone through it, it's just, it's nearly impossible to explain that nothing looks how it should, just everything looking completely off and unreal, but but hyper realistic at, at the same time, nearly like like a bad drugs trip, like a hallucinogenic drugs trip. Um, that that's what it felt like. That's what reality felt like. Hey everyone, I'm Sean O'Connor, author of the Depersonalization Manual, and today I'm speaking with Connor Curran. Connor is an Irishman like myself, who last year endured quite a serious episode of depersonalization disorder. Connor's DPDR unfortunately also coincided with a bout of long COVID, which left him struggling to deal with the physical and mental symptoms of both conditions. Thankfully, Connor has recovered completely and he's with us today to tell us about his experience. Connor, you're very welcome to the channel. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Sean. Yeah, yeah, likewise, a pleasure. Uh, Connor, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, well, as you said, I'm Connor Curran, uh, 25, an Irishman like yourself, although from um, up north, a uh, little bit far. I think it's a bit colder up here at times. <laughs> um, I, I work in technology, I work in software, uh, I work in software sales for quite a bit of company here in Ireland. Um, background from university was languages. Uh, I used to live in Spain then for a year, I taught English out there. Um, and then sort of after university, I went uh, the software route and the sales route and then took a little bit of a break from that, actually, because I had an itch that I wanted to do teaching again. So I spent a year then working back in my old high school um, as like a classroom assistant just to get some teaching experience and learned in fairly short order that, that <laughs> it wasn't for me. So I went back to the software um, always been very fit, really active, you know, into sports all throughout school. So playing football, cross country run, cycling, um, kind of well tried my hand at anything. And yeah, um, I suppose that sort of takes us up to present day. That's a good quick summation. <laughs> I always love that. Yeah, yeah. So Connor, can you tell us a bit about your experience with DPTR and how did it start for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I went through this and before it started, I had never really heard of depersonalization or derealization or, well, in the context that I would have heard it about was not what it is at all. It's not what I would have thought it was. Um, so having gone through it, it's a completely different beast than what I would have realized. And I suppose what a lot of people who, you know, thankfully wouldn't have had that experience, what would they, what it, what they would understand it to be. But yeah, I'll, I'll take you back to, to 2021. So at that time, uh, I was it was Christmas time and I was working in the school and uh, COVID was just doing the rounds. And for a few months, you know, I'd managed to avoid it and dodge it. Uh, and then eventually I got it and I didn't really think too much of it. I thought, OK, I will get over this. It's like a flu sort of thing. Um, but I noticed when I got it, I just was very, very anxious I just really really didn't feel right and for a few months prior to that I had been experiencing heightened stress and anxiety I'd gone through that for quite a while and um, I'd come out of the end of a relationship uh, obviously taking the career break and starting a new job and there's just a bit of a time of flux in my life and I just was quite unsettled so I had varying levels of anxiety and stuff for probably the last four or five months but it was definitely mounting up um, so then I got sick with COVID and then I got over it quite quickly. I want to say a week and a half, two weeks, I was feeling more or less kind of normal again. But it started to feel just a bit off after it. Um, nothing quite discernible that you could say, oh, here is, you know, this is a symptom. I just felt a bit strange. So I went back then to work, went back to my normal activity. So the gym, training, you know, running, um, weight training, all that sort of thing. Went back to my social life. So, you know, having a few drinks on the weekend, going out with your friends, just the normal stuff. And throughout January last year, 2022, I just started to experience very strange changes in my perception, the way I was thinking and feeling. Um my vision, just things just started to seem a bit off, but I still had no idea what was going on. I was thinking 
uh, it's probably just a bit of a hangover from COVID or whatever, you know, maybe it's my body's taking a bit of a hit. And then throughout February, it really started to hit. And the first things that I noticed, apart from just that feeling of real generalized anxiety, my vision changed, which was really genuinely terrifying. Um, I know, I know you're, I'm sure you're familiar with this as well, because, you know, I've read the DP manual, I've watched your videos and that. So you've mentioned all of these things and, but this was before I come across any of that. So I started to see, you know, visual snow, that pixelated layer across your vision. Um, you know, after images, this sort of thing started happening and I just felt extremely off. And from that then, that progressed into just a real feeling of disconnect from my emotions, from my personality. My memory started to get foggy. You know, it was like a, an emotional disconnect from my past. And the whole time I was thinking, what the hell is happening to me? You know, I, I didn't, I hadn't come across the term for what it was yet. So I just sort of thought like, you know, was I going crazy or what what was happening? It was it was really it was very scary. That that's how it started anyway. You mentioned as well, like that you had come across the, the term in the past, Connor. Yeah. Like the, it, I I always find it's interesting because so when when this happened to me back in two thousand and five, like I I don't think I had ever heard the term depersonalization or, or or derealization until like months and months of of googling the symptoms. And then coming across it in a forum or something and being like, all right, that's it. But I, I do find it interesting that like people seem to have more awareness, awareness of it now. But I, I am interested in what your um, what your awareness of it was before you came across it in, in, in yeah. this context. Yeah, my, my awareness of it or my understanding of what it might be like was I understood what it was like to have anxiety and stuff. But I understood it as maybe like the idea of just feeling very disconnected apathetic maybe and you know that I, I understood that it could affect your vision and stuff but I sort of imagined that it would be like your senses were dulled and that it was quite similar to depression in a way but just a real emotional disconnect you know uh, an apathy that's what I understood it to be but when it started for me for me it was the complete opposite in terms of the vision thing everything just seemed hyper realistic um, and at, at that stage, I sort of had found my way onto those similar sort of forums on Reddit and stuff. And I started reading about it. And at the start, it was scary because for me, I I found that my experience was different than other people's because people were saying that it would happen to them. It would happen to them fleetingly, that things would look 2D fleetingly for a few seconds and that that was terrifying. And, you know, things would look fake. The grass would look too green that the trees would look too sharp but that it was all quite fleeting and then it would sort of pass but for me that that became 24 7 just all the time just everything looking completely off and unreal but but hyper realistic at, at the same time maybe like, like a bad drug trip like a hallucinogenic drug trip um that that's what it felt like that's what reality felt like and then the depersonalization side just went hit in full force Um, just it was like my brain switched off to be honest with you like my personality as I understood it was gone I think the, it, it nearly just felt like my brain was cold it was on like power down mode and um, that that was really frightening as well because I just had I lost all sort of sense of my past and sense of time was distorted it was just it was extremely disorientating the whole thing was just disorientating that's really interesting what you mentioned connor about um about like the, the association that we might have with like the words depersonalization derealization that they sound they do sound like it's a dulling of the senses mm -hmm. like for doesn't who's not familiar with you might you might think that it's like kind of like you've turned the opacity down by like 25 percent, or you're kind of like you're not quite listening you're not quite tuned in to what's happening and that is there to some extent but i mean it's it is also like it's that kind of combined with like a hyper hyper awareness of your visual field of your auditory field of your senses of your of your body of your thoughts um it's 
just like a, a rush of information. It's almost like the 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 the, the filter has been opened and, and there's way too much yeah. information coming in. Even though you feel disconnected from from so many other things, you feel like almost kind of too plugged in to a bunch yeah. of other stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, um, it was, it was sort of like for me when it was happening to me, I just the recurring thought that I kept going around my head was how is this possible? Because you just take reality for granted when you've kind of lived in reality your whole life, when you've never had your field of vision change. So the recurring thought was, how, what is actually going on in my brain? How can everything look so different? You know, because it's just to somebody who hasn't gone through it, it's just it's nearly impossible to explain that nothing looks how it should, that everything just looks skewed and off and that the trees look too real. You know, that, that was it was always trees for me. For some reason, it was just always trees it was the i hated looking at them i quite like nature but yeah, I, I, I like trees <laughs> <laughs> I've, listen man i have nothing against trees like. <laughs> <laughs> it got to the point where i was i had a vendetta against them you know? <laughs> uh, i don't want to upset any environmentalists i'm very environmental <laughs> it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah 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 it, it was it was yeah. surreal surreal but hyper real yeah very strange I was I, I was the I was the same and I was like tre- trees and the the sky in particular I would just like this like I would I would be walking around like this is like after I dragged myself out of the house which in itself was was a miracle but I would I would literally be walking around and if I wasn't looking up at the sky I would be conscious of the sky looking down at me because if I if I look up at the sky it feels it it, it feels completely overwhelming both physically and kind of almost existentially it was like well there's like you know how big is the sky you know why is the color etc but also i would i would be much more likely to see things like floaters and tracers and small visual things in my peripheral vision that would absolutely freak me out yeah um and it's happening in your vision it's the sky like there's, you know, it's like, well, how, how can I possibly escape from this or divert myself from this? It's the sky. It's there. It's always there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were going through this, Connor, like, how were you, did you, were you telling people about it? Were you able to describe it to, to people, to family and friends or? Um, the only people I told at the start after I kind of gotten a handle of what was actually happening once I came across the terms and I got talking to other people that had gone through it or who were also going through it I told my parents um because I'd be quite close to them you know and I sort of knew I could rely on them but I I genuinely didn't tell anybody else I didn't tell my friends I I kept it to myself because in my mind I saw I thought this sounds so utterly ridiculous to try and explain to somebody that they'll think I'm crazy, you know, that they'll, they'll think I'm mental. So I just thought this is something I'm going to have to deal with. But I was too afraid to tell anybody because it just sounds so outlandish. You know, how, how do you explain to somebody that like the hills and the mountainsides, anything with any kind of like depth has just lost its depth? I went to and I did the usual, you know, by the way, I went to the the um, optometrist. I had eye tests done. I went to the doctor and um, all of that and I found really largely unhelpful. I mean, because the, the optometrist will tell you, no, your eyes are fine. Your prescription hasn't changed. But I'm saying, no, no, my depth perception isn't right. And I can see this visual snow, this, you know, and they're saying there's nothing anatomically wrong with your eyes, which in a way it was reassuring because I knew there was there wasn't something physically wrong as such. But it was even more than like disconcerting because I was thinking, well, what is it then? You know, what what I just wanted an answer because before you can begin to fix something, you need to understand what it is and what the answer was. Um and I had quite a negative experience with the doctor as well, because uh, they just wanted to push SSRI medication on me. This will sort you out. And I know it helps a lot of people, and I'm not against it at all, but I took it for a little bit and it 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 actually made everything worse. It made the visual stuff worse. It made my anxiety far worse. Um, I just didn't react positively to it. And I just thought, I don't think this is something that a chemical is going to fix. I, I don't think it's a chemical problem. So I don't think, I didn't think the solution was going to be a chemical solution for me anyway. 
how, how how did you describe it to the to the doctor, Connor? Because I remember for, for me when I went to, when I spoke to my doctor in Kerry back in two thousand and five, I remember saying to him things like I I because I at this stage I didn't know the term depersonalization. I had no idea what was happening, but I remember saying things like I feel like I'm not here, or I feel like there's something wrong with my memory, and the whole time and I was very 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 tentatively saying these things and the whole time I was thinking like you are ticking the boxes for crazy yeah and like and you're and there's a there'll be a van waiting outside after the after the chat with the doctor like you know um and he ultimately see he he said it, it sounds like it's just anxiety um which is technically correct, but also, but you need, you know, a lot more specificity than that. Like you need to know what, what, well, why is this affecting my vision? Like, you know, cause I felt anxious before, like I felt anxious while I was doing my leaving start and didn't affect my vision. Like, do you know what I mean? Like this is, there's something is wrong. Like, you know, like the land, the landscape looks like it's wrong. Like that, that can't be anxiety. Um, and I was so reluctant to get into the details of how I was feeling because I thought that sounds, it sounds like you're, you're crazy. Um, but it's, but people have such a kind of wide range of um, interactions with, with, with doctors. But what's interestingly, what's happening more and more often at the moment is that doctors are actually recognizing the, the, the symptoms because it's, I guess it's becoming spoken about more in, in the media. But so I'm just wondering about your, your own experience in, in terms of that, Connor, how was it describing the, the symptoms to your doctor? It's, I probably didn't go into the fullest detail that I, I should have for the same reason that you, you detailed there that, you know, I was worried that, you know, I'd be treated as crazy. Not that the doctor would have treated me that way, but that was the worry that was in my mind. And I, I found it also overwhelming that it was quite hard to sort of put it into words what was really going on. So I had a similar thing. It was um, because I wasn't sleeping at the time either. And that, you know, so it was, Okay, well, we need to give you some medication so you can at least sleep. We need to give you some. It was written off as anxiety, not not written off. I think that's the wrong word. It was diagnosed as well as anxiety. But I'm sure a lot of other people will relate to this as well. I was convinced that it was much more. I said no because what you've just said there. I've had anxiety before. I've had periods in my life where I was very anxious, and it was more than that. And um, you know, my nervous system was just completely and utterly out of whack. I couldn't calm down at all. So I was convinced that it was something more. But um, I think as well, just what you were saying there about, like I, I'm from a fairly small town in Ireland. You're from Kerry. So people watching like that's <laughs> rural and wild and isolated, you know, we, we don't probably have the access to the, the medical, I suppose, expertise that maybe people in more diverse or whatever the word would be, like bigger cities would have. So for a small town doctor as well, it's it's probably it's it's interesting when they get somebody like that because this they might be outside their their understanding or their you know their I suppose their knowledge and that's not their fault. That's it's no detriment to them. It's just it, it's it's a difficulty face when there's a lack of specialism in that area. You know, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there. I mean, people do have a sense of, of frustration with kind of a lack of a specific diagnosis, but. But I mean, the doctors, the medical professionals are they're working with the information that they have. And one of the and one of the reasons that the that the condition is not as well known as other anxiety based conditions is simply because it's it is so hard to describe and because people are reluctant to describe it. And because there's such a there's such a wide range of descriptions. So if somebody's experiencing like claustrophobia. There's there's not a whole lot of ways that you can describe claustrophobia, or there, there's not many ways where it could be potentially like misdiagnosed. Like if so, you know, it is a fear of um small spaces, of being locked into your car, of being stuck in an elevator. Whereas with like you could have depersonalization, and the main symptom, as you mentioned, Connor, could be that like there's something wrong with my vision and the and the and, and the depth of field in my vision feels wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's such a it's such a there's such a wide range of symptoms within the category that it becomes less easy to to diagnose and because of that it becomes less easy to research because research research requires large amounts of diagnoses and because of that it becomes mentioned less in journals and in the the, the DSM etc um I mean 
back in like back when it happened to me, like there was almost no medical awareness of it. But thankfully, that is changing. And now, even with the, the people people I'm speaking to, it's more and more common for me to hear from somebody who who went to their doctor and the doctor immediately recognized the the, the symptoms from what they they've been describing. Um, so thankfully, there's a much greater awareness of it. Um, but uh, um, doesn't change the fact that um, if you can't describe it and you can't get a diagnosis for for it, it can be uh, it can be no fun whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you don't mind my asking, Connor, what was the what was like the the your lowest point in the in the whole experience? Was there a particular picture particular moment that sticks with you or that you can remember? Yeah, um, you know I. I have to be sort of frank and honest about it, and I I, I want to maybe you know prephrase it with a trigger warning or whatever to anybody who may be watching. But like it did make me feel suicidal. It it genuinely did, um, because it was just so completely overwhelming, and it it felt like there was no way out of it. And at the time, I was also dealing with what ended up being long COVID as well. So. I was dealing with a lot of physical side effects of COVID and um, I wasn't able to train or exercise anymore, uh, you know, with very extreme fatigue. So dealing with, you know, the two together was just, it, it, it's sort of like everything had been taken, you know, like your trust in your body um, and then obviously your trust in your mind as well and your brain function as such. Um, so yeah, probably around April last year, actually, I, I genuinely was starting to think like, can I go through this? Can I put up with this? Um, should I even put up with this? How does this get better? And I've no shame in admitting that it, it was the reality at the time. Because it had been going on for a couple of months already at that stage, this complete sense of derealization and then the, the depersonalization together, you know. So like every day waking up and just looking around me and thinking nothing looks right, nothing looks real. That was just torture. The feeling that there is there is no way out from this. Uh, I do I do remember there was a, a very specific period of time, a few months a few months into it for me, where I was just I, I I just couldn't find an explanation. It was relentless. It was getting worse. Um, I couldn't work. I couldn't socialize. I couldn't enjoy basic things like I couldn't I couldn't listen to music and just sit down and enjoy music or or watch I couldn't sit down and watch Jurassic Park without having a, a panic attack like and it's just like e e everything everything is gone it's all it's everything's taken away yep. and 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 nobody has a lifeline nobody can give you something to 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 to, to help you out of this um certainly I mean absolutely as well the um you know, it, it's some, something that was a major aspect of, of my recovery, Connor, was like, was I, I dragged myself to the gym and I went, it was actually wasn't even me. It was a friend of mine who like said, listen, you're in a state, like you're going to the gym. And I was like, I'm not going to the gym. And he was like, you are going to the gym. Cause I was never big into sports, never big into training. But when I went, it helped because of course, like train, I mean, going to the gym, it helps it releases endorphins. It tires you out. It helps you to sleep better. You have a sense of accomplishment. You're socializing. You look better. Like it's just it it it, it it's not the, the be all and end all, but it it's a start. So for you to be in a situation where like you couldn't do that, I mean yeah. that is that must have been extraordinarily difficult. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 and, and frustrating. Um, it was confounding yeah. as well with the depersonalization because that side of my life made up so much of my personality as well, if that makes sense. Like a lot of that was me. So being physically unable to do the things that kind of in a large part made me, me was th that just compounded it and made it even worse because that was always my escape from anxiety or stress or anything like that. And give me the biggest sense of calm and, I think that being in control, you know, because a lot of anxiety, the feeling of anxiety is a feeling of a perceived lack of control. So, you know, being able to go to the gym to look after yourself, to train, to run, to cycle, that that you know, puts that's very grounding for a person. So to lose that, the ability to do that when that's such an important 
Roch is yeah, you you'd hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. There was a there was a gorgeous article doing the rounds there maybe a couple of years ago. And it was just this this young guy, I think he's in, in his twenties, just talking about going to the gym. And he said that like he feels like when you're you feel often quite adrift and there's and you feel like you know sometimes isn't that age like and with you know economic difficulties and things like that like you can often feel like you're there's a lack of control in in, in your in your life and he and it, the whole thing was just like that no matter what happens like when i go down to to the gym at seven o'clock and i run for a bit and i lift weights i listen to music and I come back and I and I feel better. And that's and that's a guarantee. That's set that is set in stone. Whatever else happens, I can go and I can feel better and I, and, I'll, and I'll sleep better and I'll look better. And I, you know, I could I could express myself that way. And for that to be and it's, and also kind of like during during COVID, like when we couldn't go to the gym. And it's like, okay, I mean, I I remember I got like um like a home action, I got like um a load of um the the resistance bands and stuff like that. And it was just it was it, w- it wasn't the same like you know there, I mean that that that's fine but I can only imagine Connor what it was like for for that for the pandemic to finish and mm-hmm. but you still can't go to the gym you still can't even probably take a jog twenty no. minutes down the road without without loss yeah. of breath like you know shortness I of breath I couldn't do anything it was just chronic fatigue all the time anytime I overexerted myself physically or mentally I would just crash and. And it was that feeling, you know, of being, being able to having been able to trust your body for so long, and then for it to then feel like it was giving up on you. I mean, that's difficult for anybody, but like especially to be in your mid twenties as well, which is everybody tells you, everybody throws it at you. This is the prime of your life. This is the best time of your life, and you're sitting there suffering in silence because you know you don't want to say, well, actually, it's not. This is the worst time. You know, there's there's all that imbued with it as well, which is. Yeah, that, that was difficult to, to deal with. Is that what you were saying earlier, Connor, about like with your with your vision, you just kind of you take it for granted. You're just like, well, it's my vision, yeah. you know, it's yeah. it's always going to be there, right? Um, and then you take you take your body for granted. And then mm-hmm. there's a there's a bunch of different things that like um that over the course of like a couple of weeks or a couple of months, they're just they're taken away from you or the the ability to use them without horrendous effort is 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 taken away i, I mean I, I remember i remember like this was i mean and this is outside of the the, the context of, of um pandemic covid because this is back in 2005 but like for me one of the worst parts of of, of getting dp and dr was that i i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't fathom how unfair it was it was just it was just like what one day everything's fine and then the next day it's like someone just yanked a carpet out from under me and i'm yep. lying on the ground and i cannot get up and nobody can help me and and now this is the rest of your life maybe yep. maybe you will never recover from this and you're just yep. kind of going like what did i do what what did i do to deserve this like mm-hmm. yeah um so connor um with all that said how did you start to recover and was it was it small iter- iterations? Was it small changes, or was it something bigger? What was it for you? It was a lot of things um, over a period of time. I think the first one was definitely feeling like I was getting my health under control. So I spent a lot of time in these forums in Reddit, and ninety nine percent of the people in them are genuinely extremely well intentioned people that want to help and they were invaluable they were genuinely a lifesaver because they make you feel understood and then a lot of them I mean a lot of them like me they're massive nerds as well so they will go on deep dives of science journals of everything and extract the best it's like a little research community that all that supports each other and if they want to find something out they will find it so in the depersonalization DPDR group there's a lot of people although I tried to stay away from that one because I realized very early on that it was only going to make me more stressed it was only it was really terrifying reading a lot of those stuff so I sort of blanked that one out but yeah a lot of it was starting to 
deal with the long COVID stuff. Um, I'll not get into the medical specifics of it, but, you know, there was different blood tests. There was all sorts of different tests that I went privately and got done because the the health system here is it's very behind with that sort of thing. So I had to go private and get stuff done. And I did. And I started to lose incremental benefits with my health, uh, my physical health. And then my brain fog started to clear as well from a lot of the stuff that I was doing. So, you know, I improved my sleep hygiene. I cut out alcohol completely. I changed my diet completely. Um, I started to do a lot more of meditation stuff, nervous system work, trying to rebalance the nervous system. Uh, cold showers, which were not fun at the start. And now I'm, I'm addicted to them. Um, a, lot, a lot of this stuff that's peddled, uh, it sort of gets the mickey taken out of it a bit as, you know, like alternative Instagram influencery sort of health advice actually really did work. It's grounded in a lot of scientific knowledge, but also traditional knowledge as well. And that I found a lot of that stuff to be very helpful. And I found that every month, my symptoms, my physical symptoms of the long COVID started to physically improve. And with that came a little bit more relief because I could do more. I could pick up certain aspects of, if you want to call it my old life. Um, and with that came more of a sense of calm and encouragement, you know. Um, in terms of the, the depersonalization and DP, the DPDR aspect, uh, I went to therapy. I got myself a counsellor. I had to talk about it and I had to really express it to somebody that understood. But even at the start of that, speaking to a therapist, a qualified mental health professional, I was still convinced that I was the first person that they'd ever seen with this or that I was the worst case of it that they'd ever seen. And they didn't really understand this. This was really, you know, and she would be telling me she was fantastic. And she would say, I see, I see people with this every day. And I'd be saying, no, but not like me, not like me. It's not as bad as I have it. And that's maybe something you can relate to as well. Um, but that, that started to alleviate and lighten that load as well. And that, that, that really helped, really, really helped. And, and was this a, was this a therapist? Connor, who was like specifically working in anxiety based conditions or did, did, did you, is that what you sought out? Yeah. So, I mean, I went online, I done counseling and stuff in the past at different times, you know, um, I'm always, I've been somebody who's been quite conscientious about mental health for a while, having gone through a few different bouts of anxiety and, and depression in my early teenage or sorry, my late teenage years and early twenties in university. And a lot of that was brought on by university lifestyle. Um, so I'm very health conscious as well, because you'll understand this university is a time you try, you know, you're drinking alcohol a lot, you're partying a lot, you're sleeping bad, your diet's horrendous, and you're probably trying other things as well. You know, you try drugs and all this. And a lot of people come to have DPDR from negative drug experiences as well. And that's probably something I had a little bit of in the past. And I do, I do believe that some of that predisposed me to it, especially if somebody of, who is of an anxious disposition or a more anxious disposition. Um, so I sort of, I've lost my track of thought a little bit, but uh, yes, the, the therapist, she's a psychotherapist and um, a psychologist as well. And she did state that those were her specialities in particular trauma anxiety because I didn't just want to do something like CBT that that was too light touch I felt I needed proper psychotherapy that's yeah so she she mentioned that like that like DPDR is something that she would encounter quite regularly is that right yeah yeah great to hear and I it is great to hear but I still find it so hard to believe because I was just thinking I've never heard of anybody else that I know or around here ever having anything like this but it does happen it happens to a lot of people I mean you devote a massive amount of your time to this so you're more acutely aware of anyone of that so yeah that that was reassuring you know it's interesting like I I had that I had that exact same thought like I I literally thought that like when I'd read up everything about depersonalization, derealization, I thought, nah, mine's mine's worse, like mine's different. <clears throat> I remember thinking, I'm going, my I have like there's going to be a version of DPDR named after me. 
I, I'm not even joking. I thought that was going to happen. I thought there was going to be like O'Connor's DPTR in medical textbooks, right? Um, the thing is, is that like everybody thinks that if you if like nobody nobody develops like agoraphobia, for example, and thinks and thinks to themselves, "Ah, mine's not that bad." You know, every everyone thinks that theirs is theirs is the worst, like you know, or is at, at the least like very very bad. Part of recovery is like is taking like as you recover, not only does your levels of anxiety reduce, but your catastrophic thinking also reduces and the racing thoughts. So you start to look at that thought from a non-anxious point of view. And when you do that, you look back at it and you say, well, like I had an anxiety based condition of, of which catastrophic thinking is one of the core symptoms. Of course, I thought that I had the worst one or that my, my version of it was the worst. Um, but it's it's so good to hear that you had a therapist or a counselor who kind of who sat with you and, and just and just said, no, 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 sure, listen, we're I'm de- de- dealing with this all, all the time. This is this is extremely common. Yeah. Um, because e- I think even if initially your first reaction is, yeah, but it's not as bad as mine, I think that he- hearing it in in those terms from a medical professional. And getting that kind of positive reinforcement, maybe even like week after week, it just it chips away at the anxiety, and it just kind of it it starts to take the 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 cert the certainty out of the anxiety that this is the worst. No one's ever had as bad as me. This is depersonalization two point oh. Um, so that's that's great to hear that you found someone who was able to provide you with that. Connor, did you? So at what point did you come across uh, my work, and uh, and how did you find that helpful? It, it was probably late February, early March 2022, yeah, last year. So I was a couple of months into this at this stage. And at that time, it was really progressing as well. It was getting worse and worse. And I was just in a pit of anxiety. And yeah, that cat- cat- catastrophizing thinking and that doom spiral uh, came across the came across your YouTube videos first, actually. Uh, and the first thing I was, I heard your accent and I was like, right, he's Irish. Okay. First of all, relatable. All of a sudden that just made me calmer right away. I was like, right, somebody down the road's got this. <laughs> it's not too bad. G- G- ginger, glasses, Irish. Yeah, I know. I just fit yeah, <laughs> the criteria. So he looks like me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I came across your work at that time. And then I, I watched a lot of your videos and I related to so much of what you said. And, um, you know, at that point, it was like, right, I know what this is now. It's something. But then it was how to fix it, how to fix it, how to recover, how to recover. And that there was a lot of OCD around that. And then I bought your depersonalization manual, read it in a day. I came home from work and spent about four or five hours trawling through it. And, yeah, just obsessing over every single word that you'd written because so much of it was, holy shit, this guy's gone through the exact same thing some of it was different mind you than my experience because it manifests in so many different ways you know and certain things you had I think from what I saw your existential thoughts were a really big thing for you and the even what you were talking about earlier with the sky it wasn't so much that for me it wasn't kind of any kind of questioning of you know the universe or stuff like that it was more just like what the fuck is going on like how is this possible that to feel this way that that was more what it was for me because I knew it wasn't normal and I I still knew that there wasn't normal there I just didn't know how to get back to it um so I started implementing then a lot of the stuff yeah in the manual the easy stuff that I could do which was you know even having a routine listening to music if you can to distract yourself talking to people hanging out with people forcing yourself to be normal even when you feel highly abnormal and ar- around that time I met my girlfriend who, who's my now my girlfriend and that was the best distraction that I ever could have had because although I felt so abnormal you know in her mind she was like it's just a normal dude he's just a normal guy and she knows better now by the way she's <laughs> um but that would that that really she really helped me as well Katie really helped because it that just gave me something else to kind of focus on this 
new person and then eventually I was able to confide in her and explain and some of it she could relate to which was amazing as well and from that speaking to friends and stuff about it as well eventually they could relate to certain aspects I remember speaking to a friend I, I went to a music festival last summer you know I really pushed myself to do normal things once I realized that I could still do them even though it felt really abnormal and things looked abnormal, I kind of, and that was something I worked on with my therapist, was acceptance, accepting it, um, because it's not going to change overnight. You're not going to find a magic pill or this one magic thing, because we all look for that, I feel, the magic pill, and it, it, it doesn't exist. And I realized that um, through doing just a lot of pushing myself to be normal, it would slowly fade away and then come back you know, it would hit again and you'd, I would panic at the start. Oh my God, it's back. I thought it was gone. But then I've learned now, especially that, and full disclaimer, by the way, I consider myself largely recovered because I feel like myself again, and I'm here talking about it in this context, but it's still not fully away. And I don't want to scare anybody with that because I know it will, but there are some days still where things visually look off but I know they're real. I know I'm real and I know it can't hurt me. That's the biggest thing. It can't hurt me because it doesn't stop me doing anything. It, it can't actually hurt you as such. It's the anxiety around it that, that hurts you. Um, it's really interesting kind of what you mentioned about the, you know, lo- looking, re- so reading through my book and being and seeing like some differences in, in, in the symptoms. It kind of goes back to something we mentioned earlier. But this was a, a major thing with me was that like I remember thinking like when I was looking through the forums back in the day that what, what I needed to find was I had to find the story of somebody who had recovered but whose circumstances were the exact same as mine. So I had to find a guy who was like 25 years old who had had a, it was triggered by a bad weed experience um, and then had another panic attack a week later who had, had who had very bad existential thoughts, who was experiencing visual stuff, who had memory problems, but who had recovered. And my and my idea was that like, if I if I looked at anybody else who who recovered, then the anxiety is saying, yeah, but they're different from you, Sean. They're not like that guy's two years older than you, like sure, or he got his from like a bad a bad MDMA, MDMA experience or something. You know, it's all it's all just kind of like flip, like kind of looking at it and trying to find the differences but what i realized as recovered was like if like if i had found that story if i had found that story of the person who exactly mirrored what had happened to me except he was living in texas or something like what would have happened would that would i have gone a oh, brilliant nice one and closed the computer i would yeah i just just kept researching it like it wouldn't it would i'd have gotten contact with him i'd yeah. have like it, it, it wouldn't it yeah. wouldn't have stopped anything because you're just you're just scratching an itch like you know it's not yeah. and you're telling yourself there's all these there's all this this logical underpinning but it's just it's just mm-hmm. obsessive research it's, it's, um, obsessive thinking and it's yeah. also interesting what you mentioned connor about like the thing of like explaining to people um like th- this was a major thing with me as well was that like i never i i i never ever posted about like stuff to do with the dp manual on my personal facebook up until relatively recently, because the, the 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 BBC did um did, did a piece about me, and of course, like I, I I post about that, and then all these people who I knew doubt the stuff, and man, the amount of people who got on to me saying like, I had that back in 2014 for a couple of months, like is that what it's called? I'm going yeah yeah yeah, and and even people who haven't experienced it like kind of chronically over the course of like four or five months or longer like if 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 someone has had a, a panic attack and panic attacks the most common thing in the world the experience of feeling depersonalized in a, in a trans in a trans um in a transient um uh, fashion or mode is like extremely common so most people will experience this um and you know if you go through life without experiencing like panic or anxiety like you need to do the lottery because if this happens to everyone, um, yeah. I, I, people were so open and, and, and I, I realized that like my reluctance to speak about it then 
was based on a fear was kind of still going back to the conversation I had with the doctor that I was still thinking like, geez, what if people think I'm a bit weird or whatever? Whereas, whereas in fact, if you go through life without experiencing DP and DR, you're, you're in the minority. Every, everybody yeah. experiences this to some degree or yeah. another, you know? What you said there about, just to go back to what your point at the start of it, was wanting to find somebody with the exact same set of circumstances as you, that, that was a huge thing for me because I, you know, even even listening and reading about it, people would say, oh, it lasts a few minutes. I'm like, this has been like lasting for months at this stage. Like I haven't been able to look out the window at a normal landscape what I think is a normal landscape in so long like it's that that was really a thing and then I came across a lot of people in the COVID the long haul COVID sub on uh, who are going through something extremely similar and I think it's something that I don't know the exact pathology behind it I'm not a medical professional um, but you find it's very common after bad viral illnesses and bacterial illnesses as well anything that really just seems to ravage the body really seems to just upset the nervous system and for whatever reason and just it it, it sort of comes as an after effect or as part of the trauma of the experience and stuff but knowing that there was a lot of other people then who were suffering from it for a similar you know through a similar set of circumstances for me was very it was very helpful at the start but then it was exactly what you said it was contacting them and then kind of living in this little bubble together and how are you today or how's this symptom for you and that's helpful but unhelpful at the same time it, it's like a double-edged sword because it gives you comfort but it also keeps you in it Jeez, i mean if you speak to any like anxiety therapist or cognitive behavioral therapist one of the things they say is that like once you like the the the, the forums and the the groups it can be very helpful in terms of figuring out and understanding what the condition is. And like that, and that was the case for me back in 2005. And it's been the case. I think it's probably the case for, for most people who get this is if they, they find out what this is by typing the results, typing the symptoms into Google and, 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 and finding a, a Facebook group or a Reddit group or something and being like, Oh my God, that's, that's the thing. But once you understand what the condition is, and you understand that it's ultimately harmless and it's temporary, it's part of your body or brain's fight or flight response. It is then incumbent upon you to, to, um, to start to focus away from it because it is the, it is the um, repeated focusing on it and consistently checking on the feelings that causes it to persist as it does with all, all anxiety based conditions. Um, that, so as you're absolutely right, Connor, it's a double edged sword. So like it's, it's a great way to figure out what it is at first and something that like, I mean, if someone had this in like in the, in the 1970s, like they would, uh, they may not have any way to diagnose it, but also if somebody get, got it in the 1970s, they then don't have to worry about like, you know, waking up at four in the morning and going onto a Facebook group and spending an hour and a half on it. Like, you know, which is what I did or, you know, or on, on Facebook, but on, on different groups back in the day. Absolutely, absolutely, a, a, a double-edged sword. Um, so uh, now that you've recovered, Connor, um, what, so what, what, what was it like kind of coming back into, into, back into working and socializing and, and was it just, it's because it, this, this is something that people kind of ask me all the time, but like, is it just like getting back to normal? People often think it's going to be this big dramatic moment, like, you know, yeah. and it's, and it's just, pretty boring <laughs> it's just you just get back it's, to doing what you're doing it's so i mean i started noticing the signs of recovery if you want to put it that way improvement last summer and it gradually would get better and then relapse and then get better and relapse all throughout the winter but during that time i got a new job so i got the job that i'm working in now and that was another really good thing to focus on although actually it was difficult too because I was still suffering from the long COVID type stuff. So the physical stuff and brain fog that came along with that. So it got hard at times to want to discern which was which. Be like, oh, is this the COVID playing up or is it the DPDR? You know, it was all that was kind of interesting. So I just took it as how I physically felt each day as an overall improvement. But it's there are moments, there are moments of clarity. I feel where you suddenly you have a week and you're like, I haven't thought about this in a full week. I've had a really normal week or 
yeah, I haven't noticed any weird vision. The, tree, the trees look fine for a whole week. You know, th- th- those moments are really great because you realise how far you've come. But for me, I think, like, the biggest thing has just been, yeah, that feeling of back to back to porridge, you know, just, like, and how thankful I am for that, of just actually things feeling boring most of the time. Um, because there are still days where it still flares its head a little bit, you know, and there are days where I still feel a bit off and whatnot, but that's okay because the curve has been like this, you know, it's, well, maybe like sort of stairs. Um, it's just been bit by bit by bit, you sort of put the pieces back together. And I, I think a really interesting thing about the experience for me with it. It's been quite an esoteric experience. It's been quite a learning experience that until you go through it, you don't really understand it. And my actual baseline anxiety that I did suffer with and which was debilitating for years has actually gone, which is the strangest, strangest thing that going through something so genuinely difficult and impossible, what felt like impossible, and still somehow coming out the other side has just like I kind of I really feel it has made me stronger. I know it's a cliche and it's an often repeated cliche, but it's in my case it is genuinely true. I, I feel I'm much better equipped to deal with just anything life could potentially throw at you from it. It's been really positive in that way. And, and I'm trying I'm not even trying my hardest to put a positive spin on it. It has been positive in that way. And it's uh it's something that I, I definitely would experience it. It's it, it's quite common because, and it, it's almost counterintuitive to to go through something that is as profoundly stressful as that. But the thing you saw is that it it also kind of reveals the truth of anxiety to you, because the one of the core tenets of recovery is understanding and internalizing what anxiety is and what these feelings are um and anxiety being like the core of like panic attacks and you know the um the 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 visual symptoms and all all the rest of it but it's like when you when you understand why it happened and you understand that as frightening as it was it's completely harmless it's uh not only was this never going to hurt you but it's a protective mechanism like a, a, a major thing for me was like when I when I was when I recovered, like when I was going through through this, I thought I thought I had schizophrenia, I thought I had dementia, I thought I had cancer, I thought I was dead, I thought it was I was in a coma. Um we'd be here to, if I went through everything, we'd be here to next week. It was just this massive list. I also thought I was going to hurt myself, I was going to hurt someone else, I thought I might crash my car if I got into the car, all the rest of it. That I, I went really through the yeah. sorry to interrupt you, just the car because no, it was really oh. driving, it was just like driving into a movie set. That's what it felt like at times that everything past the windshield of the car was not real and had no depth to it. And to be honest, it's a miracle that <laughs> I made it through that, thank God. But yeah, that that was just you know, there was I was that I was the scariest part, I thought at times. Um Mom didn't you didn't hear that mom, but like <laughs> yeah, she comes across this video, yeah. Very safe driver, but yeah, the driving bit was a big thing. I mean, the thing to remember is that like your your ability to drive isn't affected. It's it's not like you're drunk driving. It's just it's just right. that you're super super conscious of, of of what you're doing. But like I mean myself to kind of just like get into the car and just drive for five minutes, then 10 minutes, then 15 minutes or, or, over time. And but just like everything else, you realize that like you're by avoiding doing it, you're creating this unnecessary anxious association. And then when you get back to doing it and just like go and do it, and then you realize it's fine and perfectly able to do it. But um, but with all all those things that I thought were going to happen. One of which was that I'm gonna I'm gonna crash the car into a crowd of people. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna drive off a cliff, like you know, I mean, absolute like um, elaborate scenarios, catastrophic thing out of my head, like plenty of cliffs down in Kerry as well. Drive off. 
<laughs> it was a, but the thing is, I wasn't living anywhere near the coast. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing. Like, if I wanted to drive to the cliffs, like it was about an hour away. Like, I mean, sure, I couldn't, I could, like I couldn't manage that. <laughs> Anyways, but all, but all of these different scenarios, all these different catastrophic scenarios. When I recovered, I looked back on all of them, and I said to myself, like, okay, did any of those things happen? Nah. Were any of those things even remotely close to happening? Absolutely not. What, so so what, what actually was the worst thing that happened to me in all of that time? And the worst thing that happened to me in all of that time was panic attacks. Yeah. Yes. That's it. It was, and panic attacks, they're, they're, don't get me wrong, they're not pleasant. They're uh, uh, deeply unpleasant, but they're also completely harmless. They're completely common. And, and once the panic attack finishes, the panic attack finishes. Um, but it's the, as what I mean to say is that as you recover, you get that perspective on all of those catastrophic thoughts and scenarios that played out in your head. And I think that once you have that under your belt, it changes how you think about anxiety going forward because you're like, well, you know, if I can handle that, I know, and also how you think about anxiety has changed. It used to be this thing that was scary and mysterious and kind of like something that, that attacked you. And now it's like, no, this is part of my defensive mechanism. The camera angle on the anxiety changes and you just become at your core less afraid of it. Yeah. It's it's it that that's yeah, you summed it up perfectly. It's like exposure therapy to anxiety itself, because a big part of anxiety treatment is exposure therapy. And for me, that was a big thing. Um you talked about driving five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen. For me, you know, one thing that had always been very good for my anxiety was going for walks in nature, in the forest. I live beside the sea, I live beside the mountains. But with DPDR, especially DR, derealization what was normally something that was very calming became something really anxiety inducing because everything that I was looking at that would ordinarily be, you know, calming, like the, the sea, the sky, the mountains just looked fucking terrifying because it all looked weird and warped and 2D and the depth perception. So I was like, how do I navigate this? Like just everything that normally calms me down, I can't do. And then you realize you can, you just have to expose yourself to it and it can't hurt you. I remember one day at the start, I took myself for a walk. I forced myself to, and I was sitting on a bench looking uh, sort of over a, a field. And this was at the point where it was at its worst. The visual stuff was at its worst. And like the ground actually looked like it was moving. Like it was like a mushrooms trip. And I was like, just what the hell? I was like, what's next? Like, well, how can this possibly get any worse? And then I realized it doesn't matter. It, it actually doesn't matter because it's still awful anyway and I'm still here that that was quite a like an eye-opening experience because I remember just saying to myself it wouldn't matter it just wouldn't matter so yeah <laughs> and, and 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 times like that do give you a sense of um like of kind of an ability to to, to let it go to some degree because if you're like it, it kind of becomes like just ridiculous yeah. It's like what it's yeah. like it's like what's like what's the what's the point of me not being able to look at like the like the the McGillicuddy Reeks, like the yeah. m m mountains in Kerry without with freak with freaking out. What's the point of that? Like yeah. and it and you kind of and you kind of start to be like, this is ridiculous. Like this is yeah. ridiculous. Like I'm not I'm not being mugged, I'm not in the middle of a natural disaster. There isn't like yeah. an animal chasing me. I'm looking at the mountains. I love the mountains. Like, what what why is this yeah. happening? Um, and there's all those kind of subtle kind of perspective shifts happen over time and it starts and the DPDR go, it goes from being something that initially is absolutely ter like bone shakingly terrifying to something that is just really annoying mm -hmm. to something that you start to forget about to something that you realize you haven't thought about in two days. Yeah. And you just and and it just becomes less and less important, like a song that was stuck in your head. I think I jumped between those last three phases at the minute, you know, but it's never really in a way now. It's more like the odd day I'll wake up and it's there slightly, and I'm like, yeah. right, well, you know, it's like your neighbor turning up that you don't really like, but he's not too bad. It's yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
that's the kind of feeling with it. It doesn't stop me from doing anything. It's not terrifying. And then the days where it's gone, it's just gone. And yeah, everything's as it should be. There will be people watching this um, who are currently going through DP and DR who will be able to relate to your story and who may be going through something, a situation very similar to what you went through in the first couple of days, weeks and months with this. Um, what advice would you have for those people? The honest advice I would have, first of all, is give in to that urge actually to educate yourself because it, it is helpful up until a point because you need to know what you're dealing with and you need to know that other people are also in the same position, that you're not the only one because you're not. And through going through the forums and that, you'll see a lot of stuff that will make you very anxious. I haven't recovered in five years. I haven't recovered in 10 years. But you have to convince yourself that's not going to be you because it more than likely 99% isn't. And those people who do hang around those forums to recover, or sorry, that, that hang around post-recovery and say they've recovered, believe them don't question the veracity of their accounts because they're there to help and they're telling the truth i was in your position and um, i didn't think i would recover i didn't think it would go away but here i am it's only a year later and i can do everything that i could before and life is more or less as it should have been as it was before and um, the only other advice i would have i suppose is just trust yourself trust your mind that your mind is still yours it's still your own and ultimately you are sort of in control of it anxious thoughts are just anxious thoughts what sean keeps repeating and he's completely right is it can't actually hurt you you're in no physical danger and you're not crazy you're you're not crazy you're completely fine and you you will be completely fine Honor, it's been so lovely speaking with you, man. Um, thank you for uh, sharing your story and for your insight. And um, I'm delighted to hear that you're doing so well. And I know that people watching this video on the channel are going to find this um, uh, educational and inspirational. So uh, thanks, thanks again for being with us on the channel today. Yeah, Sean, thanks very much for having me and for taking the time to speak with me. And I'd also just thanks for all the work that you, you do for this condition and for all the time that you've put into it because it was an invaluable resource for me last year. Um, and it definitely contributed to me still being here today to talk about it. So yeah, thanks, man. It's 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 an honor <laughs> to chat to you. It really is. Thank That's you. My man. Th th thank you so much. I'm delighted the book was helpful. And um, yeah, yeah, listen, in, enjoy life uh, post, post recovery. And uh, yeah, thanks again for being on the channel. See you down, Kerry, at some stage. <laughs>